Nick Rowe in his five years as a POW is in a book he wrote called Five Years of Freedom. Uh, at Tan Fu, there was one, only one way in or out, and that was by chopper, and it wasn't safe that way either because you had to fly in low and always getting shot at. The terrain one kilometer away from camp for 306 degrees belonged to Charlie. That's the VC. It was isolated forces manned by American Special Forces A Detachment. Their Vietnamese Special Forces counterpart team in four companies, about 380 men on an average day of civilian irregular fence, the CIGs, as I mentioned. Uh, these were the young Vietnamese and Cambodians from the area who had been recruited, equipped to resist the Viet Cong in their home villages. It was a lonely place for Americans. Uh, from Nick's story, uh, Rocky stepped ahead of me, taking the lead for our tiny group of Americans. He hadn't gone more than five or ten meters when an automatic weapon fire from the right and Rocky sagged, then dropped with a low moan. Oh, shit, no. Not now. I started towards Rocky's crumpled shape and started to kneel. A muffled whomp to my front, a spell of stinging hot water and a huge fist slamming me backwards. I sat there up to my waist in water, the smell of burned black powder in my nostrils. My eyes were refusing to focus. Everything was multicolored haze. Sounds were coming from the end of a long, long tunnel. Everything was so far away. In other words, there was a mortar round or artillery round came in and hit right in front of him. The thought stood out in the gray fog that was my mind. I'm dead. He just kind of sit there dazed. But then as he came to a little bit, he cleared his head and started taking care of uh, Rocky's three wounds. Rocky was wounded three times in the leg. One of them uh, went through his kneecap. Um, I was making the final turn with the bandages. The reeds rustled behind me. Dong Tay, Dong Tay Lin came to sharp demand, which would probably be uh, surrender or what I don't know what it is in Vietnam right now but came to sharp demand. I tied the bandage and slowly turned my head. There was a muzzle of an American carbine and, and a Viet Cong behind it. The two VC pulled my equipment harness from my shoulders, grabbed my arms, and quickly tied them behind me, once at the elbows and once at the wrist. God bless you, Nick. God bless you too, Rob. Uh, this is when he was first captured. Uh, it was taking him back. Then they get him to a uh, somewhat of a uh, POW camp. And his second day there, I was spending more time running between the cage and the latrine than anything else. That's when he started having dysentery problems. We had been in, during that time, he was issued a pair of gray pajamas and a aluminum cup, a plate, and a spoon apiece. Now, that's what he carried all the way through Vietnam, all the way during the Pearson of War, was that cup, the plate, and a spoon to eat from. On the morning of 21 November, Dan and I were given a small can of sweetened condensed milk, which made the day seem like Christmas. We opened it at the urging of Mr. Moy. Now, they, went, they, chained, they uh, made special names for all their uh, guards and so forth. Uh, they, were, they had some uh, uh, yes, yes. I mean, they had uh, nicknames for them so they could keep up with who they were. But Mr. Moy and, and Major Ha, uh, who appeared anxious for us to, uh, to drink and eat, um, as soon as the cannon was open, photographer appeared. He was standing there in front of us. He took several shots of us with the milk. One was me scooping the delicious liquid out of my cup while Dan scowled. It was a long time before he saw another can of milk. Now, as the story goes along with that, they offered it to Dan and Nick. Nick said, uh, I'm hungry. I'll eat whatever I have to eat. Uh, Dan Pitzer said, that was Nick. And Dan said, I ain't going to let him take a picture of me. That photographer was later killed in a battle. Somehow or another, that picture was recovered. This is Ron Harris's, a uh, copy of Ron Harris's picture, it didn't come out too well, of, uh, that he did uh, a pen and ink drawing from that picture. Uh, Dan Pitzer asked uh, Ron to do this drawing uh, of him and Nick from the picture. But that picture, for some reason or another, was put in Dan Pitzer's 201 file for years. And it was well uh, sometime later uh, when that picture was discovered and Nick got it out and 
I gave it to Ron, and that, this picture is also in the Pentagon uh, with uh, of them sitting on the tiger cage eating that condensed milk. Uh, my dysentery, which had gone progressively worse, was now accompanied by fever and nausea. There was a continuing inability to eat rice. Now, all of them, when they first got there, uh, had trouble eating the rice. Uh, you're told not to drink the water, but they didn't have much choice uh, when you go back. The rice was not uh, kind of cooked like you would normally think it would be, but uh, they, were having, he was having, uh, they were all having a problem getting it down and so forth. They were always getting propaganda uh, officers come in and talk to them, uh, re-education, trying to re-educate them to uh, talk up a talk and tell them what was going on as far as Americans, uh, re-education to make them to believe uh, as the communists did. Uh, didn't work most of the time. In January 1964, after two months, the guards from our first camp disappeared along with Major High and Mr. Ba and Moy. They were in and out, but even though they were in and out uh, periodically, one of those visits, Mary was squatting on, in the guard hut next to our cage as Dan and I sat on the front porch. Do you know that Kennedy was killed? He asked slowly, carefully, in Vietnamese to uh, get a response from them. Uh, you got to remember, the only news they got what was going on then was either from Hanoi, Hannah, or what the guards told them. Uh, sometime before this, we had been told earlier that uh, uh, South Vietnamese President uh, Din was, uh, had been overthrown and killed. The government of Saigon was toppling. The possibility that these reports might contain some truths made me wonder what was happening on the outside. I finally dismissed these reports uh, as false. I mean, they were going in and told how the American government was uh, crumbling, uh, the Vietnamese government was crumbling, and, and so forth. Now, the last week in January... Dan and Rocky were removed from the camp, leaving me by myself. Now, that was one of the things he was most worried about. I was again tormented by the thoughts of being in the camp alone. The fear of immediate death stilled, but the fear of unknown was a greater burden. I was given a pair of pajamas made from old rice sacks dyed with black dye that ran the first three or four times I washed them. In other words, they weren't as black after he washed them a few times. On February 15th, the concern about my, his continued loss of weight and problem with diarrhea was at an all-time high. He was eating the same rice as, uh, as, as Dan and, and them had been uh, eating, but he was still, uh, where Dan was losing weight and so forth, uh, he was getting worse and worse. Year one passed on 29 October 1964, and as he was, I was eva evaluated, our situation with Rocky separated from us, John, a new POW, added to the camp. Dan had been brought back, Dan in still dangerous condition himself, and myself weekly and daily from the constant diarrhea. The only bright spot was that we're still alive. That was their first, first anniversary. The year year began with a frightening explanation for my relative lack of weight loss while eating the same food as Dan. The healthy weight became an obvious abnormal swelling in my legs and abdomen. I had practically ceased to urinate. They pronounced the swelling a result of thung. I had very, very, and was bloated with stored food, fluid. Now, if you ever read any pirate stories, uh, always on the sea, they, uh, the sailors always had problems with very, very because they didn't get fresh vegetables and so forth in their, in their diets. That's where uh, basically the very, very came from. Now, at the end of April 1965, I was having severe problems with the LAC, LAC, fungus infection. I found myself perspiring heavily during the morning hours, which aided in lowering the salt level in my body, but irritated the splotch raised areas of fungus terrifically. The itching sensation was deep and continuous over the broad covered by the abnormal, abdominal disease. Bathing was difficult because the canal was practically dry and I had to dig a hole in the middle of it in order to get enough murky water to rinse off. Even if I had soap, it would have done any good, since the water did nothing more than replace the dried perspiration with a light coating of silt. The diarrhea had slacked off a bit, but maintained two or three times uh, regularity. Uh, the uh, fungus and so forth, it covers his, almost his entire body, uh, especially down in his gen genitalia area. Um, after his, uh, another escape attempt, he was inside his cage, 
My legs were thrust into the regular irons. That's the, every night when they put him in the cage, they put him in leg irons and, and, and tighten them up. Um, the, in regular iron that he'd been using. Then Slim, that was one of his guards, uh, grabbed my arms and fitting the U-shaped pieces over my biceps, ran the long bar under my back, threw the loops in my ankles, fastening my arms to my sides. I watched with attached interest as we proceeded to pull a bar up and under my shoulder blades, canning the angle, anklets back at a 45-degree angle and fastening the two ends of the rod, making it impossible for me to do more than bend my arms at the elbow. The leg iron was pulled down until I winced with pain. Doc Hong? He asked, without emotion. Is there pain? I nodded yes. He grunted and gave it a couple of extra tugs, sending spikes of pain into my already cramping muscles. So now he's in, the, in his cage with his arms pinned behind his back and to his legs and so forth. Um, as I mentioned before, his, most of his information came from uh, Radio, uh, Radio Hannah. Uh, I know Hannah, as we used to call her, was, there, was our source of uh, news and it added nothing to raise our spirits. There was increasing use of U.S. reports and editorial comments on them by the North Vietnamese to validate their stand on the war. Uh, Hanoi Hanna made sure that they guys knew about all the protests and all the things that were going on back in the United States. Uh, the dissent within the United States gave them a means to encourage their followers, influence the uncommitted, and challenge their opponents. Just the fact that the reports were in good English and came from Americans whose protest to the war took the form of support for the enemy was enough to create a feeling of hopelessness. You're out there, you're going through all this sort of stuff, all the disease, uh, deprivation, and you hear, all you hear on the news is uh, how things are going back in the United States, how the uh, protests are going on. You start wondering, what the hell am I doing here? Especially, what am I doing here as a, uh, as a POW? I could just imagine how much uh, helpless he felt. I felt somewhat the same way uh, when I was watching the, uh, the riots and so forth uh, while I was over there. This was uh, a little later on, an older cadre. Uh, different people, different people would come into the camps and um, interrogate him or try to teach him the communist way. Uh, he always argued with them, uh, gave them uh, strange information, and so forth. Uh, the older cadre came in. His was uh, this guy traveled around from camp to camp interrogating prisoners, but he began to speak, and the mafia translated. You are a POW row. And you are here to learn the decision of the Central Committee of the National Liber Front for Liberation of South Vietnam. Your comrades are no longer prisoners. They are to be released under lenient policy of the Front and allowed to return to their homes and loved ones. I knew this was coming, but it was still a shock. They were actually going to release them, and I was going to stay. Jim was with Dan and John. Then it hit me. I was alone. This is when they took Dan and John and, and Jim. Uh, I believe Jim was the one that was uh, pretty sick. And they took them out and left Nick there by himself. I passed my fourth year of captivity on 29 October 1967, thanking God that I was still alive, that three of our group had been released in, in time for their lives to be saved. Because he knew that Dan and them were in such bad shape. But he's all by himself. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Vietnam, there's a big holiday every year. It's called Tet. It's the Lunar New Year. It somewhat goes along with the uh, Chinese New Year. Tet in Vietnam is a big time of celebration, uh, families coming together. There's nothing bigger in Vietnam than Tet. It's like Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, all, all rolled into one. Uh, during that, and that period of time, 67, 68, the communists decided to, uh, well, we need a ceasefire. That way that our troops can go home and see their families, and the South Vietnamese troops can go home and see their families. So that was, uh, they decided to, let's have a ceasefire, and we're just going to put our weapons down and, and have the Tet uh, uh, holiday, and then we'll go back to fighting. They said, your net and clothing are not dry yet. You can sleep like a soldier of the Liberation Army tonight without a net. In other words, he was saying they could, he could sleep uh, just like the, uh, the VC had to sleep. 
The torn and frankly mended shorts were no good at all, and my body was soon completely covered with swarming, probing insects. The first sensation of hundreds of simultaneous penetrations and injections of the insect's antichologen is almost an exquisite pain like the sharp bite of a lemon juice on a fresh tooth extraction. It rapidly began as intolerable annoyance. I could feel the pulpy mass in my hand each time I slapped at a concentration of stings and crushed another 50 or so of my tormentors. There was no spot on my body that wasn't covered now. They drove up my face, neck, arms with fanatic urgency. I don't even want to th think about the, how, just how bad that was. Once in contact or near the source of human warmth, they seemed to go berserk in their plunge to reach blood. I could sense the welts rising from the constant assault. I couldn't kill them fast enough. Blood and crushed mosquito bodies smeared my skin, and this drove the new arrivals into a wilder frenzy. The constant, unrelenting torments was indescribable. Numbness had given way to raw, open, sharp pain as the nerve endings writhed upon the onslaught. The body's defense were overwhelmed. The nervous system was flashing red lights across the board. Now, all this is coming from Nick uh, and how he was uh, thinking about it at the time. After, sometime after that, uh, Nick was taken to a hut where another older man was there. And this is what the uh, uh, older man says. I am a representative of the Central Committee. Having come to this camp to say a few words to you. His voice, his voice was easily identifiable as one accustomed to command. It is fortunate for us that the peace and justice-loving friends of the South Vietnam Front for National Liberation in America, now it's important that you realize that it came from America, have provided us with information, which leads us to believe you have lied to us. According to what we know, you are not an engineer. You are not assigned to the military, to the many universities in which you have been uh, uh, listed for us. You have much military training, which you deny. The location of your family is known. You are an officer of the American Special Forces. Your father's name is Lee, and your mother's name is Florence. Next comments. I felt myself cringing inwardly as my carefully constructed cover story came crushing down around me. The words became a blur of sound. He was picking me to pieces. Oh, dear. God, I'm scared. God, I'm scared. I fought to control the trembling in my bent knees, fought to mask the effect that pieces of paper was having on me. He wasn't guessing. He knew. Now, one day when he was uh, cleaning up around the kitchen and so forth, uh, he looked and saw a set of orders that had his name on them. And he took time to read them. And this is what Nick says to say about it. The order I had seen in their ammo container filed for me to be transferred from regional level to zone level effectively marked me for extinction. They knew, he knew that he had been, they caught his lie. They knew they were mad. And they knew when they transferred him out that he didn't have very long. Now, along about that same time in the, in, in the uh, frame, there was been a lot of activity of uh, uh, Planes coming out, helicopters coming to work in the area. So they were having to constantly move the camp around, uh, spending nights and so forth, uh, hiding out in the jungles and so forth. Uh, and, of course, Nick is dressed up as uh, looks like the V.C., but they had to keep moving around, and he decided this was a good opportunity for him to uh, possibly escape. But there was a problem, and he tells us the problem. It was obvious that I was wearing black pajamas, and would look like any of the VC to a pilot, and my deep tan face, even with a beard, would be just another horror-stricken VC face in his, to his combat condition eyes. The split-second hesitation required for him to identify my beard and relate to the Asian lack of facial hair would be time enough for me to shoot him out of the sky. That's how low the helicopters and stuff were flying, if he were wrong. It wasn't actually a beard he thought he had seen, no, the pilot would not hesitate to shoot him first in this situation, and I don't blame them one bit. That had to be uh, quite a uh, dilemma. You want to escape, and you know that if you jump up and holler, here I am, uh, they're going to come in, uh, guns blazing, and so forth. 
I evaluated my chances and came up with a grim picture. The guards had standing orders to kill an American prisoner if they couldn't guarantee his security. It was a case of kill him rather than take the chance of having him get back to the Allies. In other words, kill the prisoner and not so he can't get back to the Allies. Um, signaling, signaling a helicopter would be damn risky at best, but he still had to make a decision. During the running around trying to hide from the uh, helicopters and the bombings coming in, uh, Nick was able to uh, tell his guard, "Don't follow the other guys. They don't know where they're going. I'm, I'm American. I know where they. I know how the Americans think coming in." So his guard started second guessing and followed Nick, and that's how Nick got his guard away from the rest of the Viet Cong or, or communists was by telling the guy that he would lead him from away from where they were going. So uh, he gets his guard uh, out there. Uh, kind of by himself. He sees the uh, helicopters coming in close. So this is what he says next. I selected a short limb, almost two inches in diameter, and stepped quickly behind Porky. That was his guard's name. The sharp blow caught him at the base of the skull, just below the back of his floppy bush hat. He sagged and dropped immediately without making a sound. I dropped the club and chopped him twice with the edge of my hand, delivering the blows to the side of his neck below the jawbone. I didn't intend to kill him, but I didn't want him to follow me when I moved out. Up in the Cobras, this was the Cobra helicopters coming in, shooting up the area. I learned, the, uh, from, I learned later, the radio crackled into life. They saw him standing out there waving a, uh, a white rag. There's a VC, VC down there in the open. And then all of a sudden, on the other ship was, from the other ship came to reply, gun him. The covers were preparing to make a firing pass which would have reduced me to another, cr another crumpled heap of body, uh, bloody flesh and tattered rags. But he had to do what he had to do. From the command ship, which had been joined by the, uh, joined the covers, came the voice of Major Dave Thompson, flight commander of this group. Wait one. I want a prisoner. Cover me. I'm going down to get him. They saw the beat. They saw a person standing out there in the middle of the field waving a rag. They didn't know who it was, but they figured even if it was a Viet Cong, uh, there was a chance they could get, catch him and uh, get him as a prisoner. Um, so as the gunship is coming in or the command ship is coming in, the door gunners strained to catch a glimpse of the black clad figure standing in the clearing waving that white cloth. Their fingers were tense upon the triggers of their M60 machine guns and they waited to foil any trap that might have been set. Suddenly, one of them looking down spotted the beard. Wait one, sir. The shout went over the microphone with an urgency unique to one soldier who sees another in need. That's American. The response was immediate. What they had to worry about was uh, quite often the Viet Cong would throw a smoke grenade trying to uh, lure a helicopter to come in to pick up a non-existent wounded and so forth. So Nick was uh, brought back, uh, put in the hospital, you saw, uh, interrogated to a certain extent, uh, debriefed uh, about his episode there. Uh, in 1971, Nick was assigned to the Army Adjutant Generals to work on the Army's POW MIA program. He uh, did a lot with that. He was also a uh, work with the League of Families, which was the families of uh, the POW MIAs. Uh, during that period of time is when he wrote the book and published it, The Five Years of Freedom. He wrote several uh, magazine articles and, uh, and so forth. He also wrote the Southeast Asia Survival Journal for the United States Department of Air Force. This was a, uh, the first kind of seer school uh, training that he did for the Air Force, teaching their people how to become, uh, if they became uh, POWs and so forth. In 1974, Nick decided to leave active duty but continued to serve in the United States Re 